Hello, everyone, and thank you for joining us for our August Glaze webinar. My name is Haley Hawley, and I'm the Director of Operations at Glaze, which is the Greenhouse Lighting and Systems Engineering Consortium. Um, if you haven't heard about Glaze before, we are a public-private consortium, and our mission is to transform greenhouse lighting and systems management to support climate-smart controlled environment agriculture. And we do that by researching LED systems, plant photobiology and physiology, and greenhouse environmental controls. We do research, we do education, and oops, sorry about that. We do research, we do education, and we facilitate networking between our industry members, which include both manufacturers and CEA growers. These are our current members, and of course, we always want to give them a shout out. It's because of them that we're able to do these public webinars like this and get all of this information out to the public. I also want to uh, highlight the webinars that we have coming up for the rest of this year's webinar series. So in September, we're going to have Michael Evans talk about lighting research at the Control Environment Agriculture Innovation Center. In October, we're going to have David Caesar and Luke Lelier from Agritecture talk about design considerations for large-scale CEA pro projects. And in November, we will have Ruanito Ferrarezzi from University of Georgia talk about effects of light spectrum on nutrient uptake. And today, uh, we will be hearing from Maya Ezzedine, who is the sustainability leader at Schneider Electric, about creating a sustainable life cycle and control environment agriculture. And remember that during these presentations, there is a Q&A box at the bottom of your Zoom screen that you can use to ask questions, and we'll save some time at the end and in the last half of the um, of the presentation for an open audience Q&A, which will be facilitated by our executive director of Blaze, Gretchen schimmel Finnick. Just check on the email really fast. Still not getting an email from you, Maya. Mm, I've sent it to you and to Gretchen now. Okay. So I'll tell you a bit, a bit about Maya. So Maya is an environmental scientist and sustainability specialist who completed her PhD at Cornell University in 2023. Her research examined carbon emissions that stem from the CEA supply chain, examining embodied emissions from pr production inputs, emissions from on-site activities and waste management, and consumer willingness to pay for CEA products based on labeling. Now, Dr. Ezzedine is the sustainability leader at Schneider Electric, working to reduce embodied emissions within product offerings and throughout the supply chain, and to improve recyclability and circularity. Maya brings with her 15 years of environmental consulting experience and has a BS in environmental science from UC Davis and an MS in sustainability management from Columbia University in the city of New York. Okay, hi everyone, and thank you, and sorry for the technical difficulties. Um, so um, thanks, Haley, for the introduction. Um, and uh, this, uh, what I'm presenting today is called Towards a Sustainable Life Cycle in Controlled Environment Agriculture. Uh, basically, um, this is the summation of my uh, PhD work um, at Cornell. Um, and I had the opportunity to work under um, Drs. Um, Anu Rangarajan, uh, Neil Matson, and Jamie Lynn Perry, um, who helped to guide my research throughout my time there. Um, Today, I'm sustainability leader um, at Schneider Electric, um, and what we're doing is um, working on reducing scope three emissions within our supply chain, which is very much tied to the work that I did while I was at Cornell. Um, so we have uh, what's called uh, eco design um, principles in place, which we're trying to apply across our portfolio. So basically, oh, wonderful, yay, okay, great. So here is the slide show. So you can move to the next slide. Great, uh, you can put it in full screen so that you can go through slides. So in our eco-design principles, um, there we um, are helping to 
uh, improve the energy efficiency of our products, um, resource efficiency. So even the materials that are used in order to um, make uh, the products, extending the life of the products so that things don't go to landfill as quickly, reducing uh, impact from uh, the types of materials. So for example, uh, pr preferring recycled content when we can, um, avoiding the use of, of um, metals or, or rare minerals that are hard to mine or are rare and difficult to find, um, reducing packaging impacts. Uh, for example, uh, we're trying to eliminate plastic from our packaging um, and make everything recyclable um, and the like. Uh, next slide, please. So a big portion of this is also designing for recyclability. So this ties in again to a lot of what I'll be talking about in a minute from my PhD work. Uh, so because um, with the, my role at Schneider, we're working on a lot of hardware products so that uh, everyone's heard a lot about e-waste and how much of a pollution problem this is becoming. So we're making sure to design products in a way that it's easy to um, recycle them. So basically that'll mean it's easier to dismantle them. It's easy to separate materials from another so that they can easily be recycled uh, and the like. Next slide. Next slide. The overall goal is to reduce our scope three emissions by 25% using 2021 as the baseline and um, uh, hoping to achieve this reduction by 2030. So today we'll be talking about the same type of work, but in the CEA supply chain. Um, so I'll be going through five parts and I'll try to fly through a little bit in some sections to make up for lost time. Um, but uh, the idea is to follow the supply chain of CEA and see where sustainability improvements can be made along the course. Next slide. So as mentioned, uh, these are these are my wonderful advisors throughout my time at Cornell, and the project uh, was funded by the National Science Foundation, and um, had the opportunity to be a part of Cornell Cal's. Next, so part one: common materials and methods, and the relationship of CEA inputs to the subsequent waste output. So it's always really important to remember that whatever we're putting into a system is also what's gonna be coming out of that system. It sounds really basic, but it's, it's an important consideration. So here uh, we'll fly through a few slides, just looking at uh, different types of growing methods. So um, Haley, you can go through fairly quickly the next slides because everyone um, on the call most likely uh, has an awareness of different types of growing methods. But based on the, next slide, based on the growing method that you use, such as in the next slide, you'll see deep water culture. So here we're using foam boards, which have the opportunity to be um, reused repeatedly. Um, I think you went a little too far ahead. Uh, um, so, um, foam boards, which can be reused repeatedly um, before they're discarded. Uh, so we'll move on to part two here, uh, which is getting more into the meat and potatoes of everything. So um, one of the common substrates used in CEA is stone wool, also referred to as mineral wool or rock wool. Um, and um, here we'll be digging into upstream emissions. So basically, we're taking a product that was already manufactured and bringing it to our farm facility. And we have to be aware of the fact that various inputs already have um, embodied carbon um, in them. So this is based on the, the process of uh, manufacturing this product. It's also related to emissions from transportation and things like that. Next slide. So in the next slide, you'll see the stone wool manufacturing process. So um, this is a, a figure that was provided by Rockwell. It's uh, publicly available. Um, so they show you here the basic process of making rock wool or stone wool. So in order to um, create the substrate, we have to create a man-made furnace, which is similar to a, a volcano in terms of its uh, <laughs> power and, and heat. Um, and in that uh, furnace, we're putting in um, various uh, 
raw materials. As you can see in the bottom left, we have stone, we can have coal, uh, there are resins and things like that. So um, a lot of times what we use is stone as well as slag, which is usually a byproduct of another industry. So this is a recycled material, but there is only a certain amount of slag that can go into stone wool in its manufacturing in order to have the structural integrity that we want and have a more durable product. So this all goes into the furnace and then it's spun in a spinner, as you can see there um, in the bottom in the middle, uh, which is basically like a giant cotton candy machine that's spinning stone into fibers, just like cotton candy, and then creating what we know as stone wool or rock wool. Next slide. So in this um, portion of the research, um, there was a new uh, facility, a new Rockwell manufacturing facility that was coming online in Ranson, West Virginia. It's now an active facility and it was built on this plot of land that you can see in the map here that I created. Um, so it was formerly agricultural land. It's still based in an agricultural area. And um, where you see all those red marks that are labeled with uh, numbers and letters, uh, those are all um, stacks. So a stack is basically like a smokestack or a chimney. Um, and it's where there's a different process happening at that facility where we have exhaust coming out of the facility. So there are 42 stacks at this proposed facility. So because this research um, began before the uh, facility went online, um, we're using everything related to the proposed um, facility, but the built facility is very similar to what was proposed. Uh, next slide. So we can see that from a stack, there's a variety of different pollutants that'll be dispersed to the surrounding environment. And um, based on the type of pollutant, based on environmental factors and ge uh, geographic factors um, and, and other things like that, will depend on the dispersal um, distance. It'll depend on where these pollutants end up. Um, do they end up in the air? Do they end up on the ground? Do they end up in the subsurface below the ground? for example, impacting groundwater? Um, do they end up on the plants that the agricultural facility is located around there, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Next slide. The EPA has a um, uh, air quality index, which is uh, summarized in this table here. So this is um, publicly available knowledge from the EPA. People have probably started to hear about it a lot more in the mainstream media lately with a, a lot of the forest fires that have been happening that have been impacting air quality. So the EPA came up with this air quality index, which basically allows us to identify the concentrations of pollutants based on the type of pollutant, how much of a pollutant in uh, an area will result in what type of health conditions. So for example, um, uh, how much of um, particulate matter um, or, or carbon monoxide do I need to be exposed to for it to start being considered unhealthy or hazardous? So this is what that table allows us to identify. Next slide. So in order to model uh, the dispersal of pollutants from uh, the proposed uh, stacks um, at the site, um, I was able to get some data about the regional wind speed and direction typical for that region. Um, and this is what's summarized here in the table. And in the next slide, you'll see that I created a windrose, which allows us to see basically all those data points mapped on this windrose in order to see the typical direction that we expect pollutants to move. So here we can see that the most of the year, in a typical year for that region, um, yeah. the wind is happening to move towards the west. So we expect that, therefore, pollutants to go from east to west. In the next slide, you'll see that, again, um, environmental conditions around the area are also really important. So soil porosity and type um, are very important because if pollutants end up on the ground, they can end up in the ground as well. And so the more porous uh, the type of um, ground cover is, the more likely that those pollutants will migrate into the subsurface. So for example, if you have a paved surface that doesn't have a lot of porosity, so you won't have migration of pollutants very easily, 
But then if you have a more rocky type of uh, subsurface where there are a lot of holes of air in between the rocks, you'll have more ready, uh, ready migration. In this specific area around the 104 acre site, which is for the um, facility, the factory, uh, the bulk of the area is considered very rocky and it is in an agricultural and residential area and more than half of the local area uses private wells for drinking water um, and for irrigation. So um, according to the EPA, these um, private wells are not um, under their jurisdiction. So there are no regulations on the water quality that happens within these wells. Next slide. So um, by mapping the AQI, the um, air quality index, to the concentration of a pollutant. And here we're focusing on criteria pollutants, which are the top pollutants that the um, EPA considers um, important to pay attention to. They call them criteria pollutants. So for NO2 um, or SO2, we see on these graphs that uh, basically what this is showing is that as more and more of this pollutant gets into the uh, surrounding environment, at what point does it become hazardous or at what point does it become unhealthy? Um, and based on the slope of the curve, we're able to determine basically how much of how rapidly we'll be able to achieve basically unhealthy or hazardous conditions. So in both of these cases, there's a pretty steep curve there right at the beginning. So that means that it really um, rapidly goes up from a good situation to unhealthy, which is marked with the orange bar there. Next slide. And so this is a reminder of those AQIs. So next slide again, we'll see um, for uh, the AQI for SO, sorry, uh, uh, CO, you can slide again one more, um, where we compare that to the two tables that we looked at before, NO2 and SO2. So for carbon monoxide, CO, we see that it's a bit more of a gradual climb up. And in the next slide, we can see for particulate matter. So particulate matter, there are usually um, most often two categories, PM10 and PM2.5. And what that means, it's basically the size of the particulates. So um, PM2.5 are really, really small particulates. PM10 are slightly larger particulates. Um, so with PM10, it takes a much more gradual exposure until we reach um, hazardous levels. But with PM2.5, really small particulates, that is a really rapid upshoot. So um, it's really something that would be uh, concerning more quickly is what this is indicating to us. Next slide. So looking at the 42 stacks at the site, um, based, because each stack is related to a different type of activity that's happening at the factory, they're going to have different types of pollutants that are exiting from that specific stack. But we see that out of the 42, all 42 are, um, are um, emitting particulate matter, both 10 and 2.5, 12 are emitting carbon monoxide, and 11 are emitting both NO2 and SO2. So these are the criteria pollutants that we're focusing on here. Next slide. You can see in detail now, um, basically the relationship of the concentration of what's going out of each of those stacks, the 11 stacks that had those um, unhealthy to hazardous level AQIs are here in this list. And we can see the type of activity that's in relation to it. So this is all, these are all steps related to the manufacturing of rock wool, which is then later used as a substrate um, in our uh, growing operation. So we see um, in the bold numbers, those are all areas where um, we've gone above healthy uh, concentrations. Next slide. To put this a little bit in more perspective, I wanted to show kind of what this all means in other types of terms. You know, so what are 138,000 metric tons of CO2 per year? Um, so first of all, we use metric tons of CO2e, which is CO2 equivalent. So basically, as we saw, there are various types of pollutants, but how do we compare these disparate types of pollutants? Well, we equate them all to carbon dioxide. That We use that kind of as a uh, comparison point. So that's why it's called CO2 equivalent. So a stone wool factory operating in the US for one year is, the same, is emitting the same amount of emissions as about 31,000 
cars being driven or about 155 and a half million pounds of coal being burned um, and etc. These are just um, different examples here that you can use for comparison. Next slide. I wanted to also show um, how we would be able to avoid such emissions. So in order to avoid the same amount of emissions, we would have to um, uh, recycle instead of landfill 6 million trash bags to equate the um, operation of a stonewall factory for one year um, or switch out over 5 million incandescent bulbs for LEDs. These are just examples. And in the next slide, you'll see what it would take to sequester or store and harness the same amount of emissions. Well, it would take over 2 million um, seedlings that have been growing for 10 years, it would take over 165,000 acres of U.S. forests to capture that amount of carbon. Next. So overall recommendations specific to substrate here is when possible, do avoid um, non-reusable substrates. Um, and when possible, do avoid non-compostable substrates. So sometimes people do compost um, stone wool. However, it is not something that will break down. Um, so it's it's a bit of a debate whether or not um, stone wool is compostable. Um, so when possible, there are some substrates that happen to be byproducts of other industries or that can be sourced locally. Um, so that could be something that can be looked into. Um, if one is to use peat, which we didn't really talk about today, um, we could opt for peat that was farmed rather than sourced from natural bogs because natural peatlands, although they only cover 3% of the world's surface, they actually store up to 33% of the world's carbon. So they're really important carbon stores. And when we harvest that peat, we're releasing that carbon from storage. Uh, next slide. I'd like to now look a little bit more downstream in the supply chain and look at waste solid waste specifically, that is produced at a typical CEA facility. So um, next slide. Here we're focusing on um, the waste that comes out of the CEA facility, as you can see in the next slide. Um, so um, just wanted to highlight like where exactly our boundary is for this portion of the research. So it's everything that comes out of the facility that is non-retail. So we we have our raw materials coming into the CEA facility, and then we have our retail products coming out, such as our produce, etc. But then we have our waste that's also coming out. So this, this is where we're looking at. So in the next slide, you see that I had the opportunity to interview um, and collect data from 14 farms, um, various CA farms across the United States. Um, they had different types of growing methods, different sizes in terms of grow space, in terms of employees, in terms of number of facilities, and they used a variety of substrates. So this helped to give a nice well-rounded snapshot of some common farming practices in CEA and the waste that comes out of it. In the next slide, we can see the waste assessment results. Um, so basically, this tells us the types um, and frequency, the frequency that each of the farms reported um, having this type of waste. So we see that harvest waste is something that all farms reported. In the next slide, we see that substrate was also something reported by many farms, but in terms of type of substrate, well, we had six that were using stone wool and six that were using peat. In the next slide, we see that 13 out of the 14 farms um, reported having cardboard as one of their waste products. And this typically came from shipments of materials that they would use in their facility. Um, so products would come in on um, in boxes, those boxes would be on a pallet and that pallet would be wrapped with plastic wrap typically. Um, so that plastic wrap was also reported by seven farms. Next slide, you'll see that um, plastic containers were also a common um, waste item that was reported. 11 out of the 14 reported that. So these would be containers of, for example, nutrient solution or clamshells that were damaged and were unusable, so had to be disposed of. Because remember here, we're only focusing on the waste that comes out from the CEA facility itself and not the, for example, clamshells that we would be disposed of by the end user. 
And in the next slide, we can see some other common um, uh, waste types that were um, often reported. So we had different seedling trays. After a certain point, they break, they have to be uh, replaced. Um, a lot of PPE, personal protective equipment, well, that's kind of difficult to recycle most of the time. Um, we do have equipment that breaks and needs replacement over time, um, et cetera, et cetera. So in the next slide, we'll be able to see some examples of some of these waste products in the photos. Um, and in this part of the research, um, we're looking specifically on volume data. So before I was just asking folks, well, how often are you, or what waste types are you seeing? Well, some of the uh, interviewed farms were actually able to give me quantities um, and frequencies of each of those waste types. So now um, uh, out of those, we had um, 14 uh, uh, farms that uh, had um, information on um, plastic containers, um, and et cetera, et cetera, as you can see in that box. So the most common waste types out of all of the interviewed farms were plastic containers, organic waste, such as harvest waste and um, uh, organic substrates and things like that, uh, PPE, personal protective equipment, cardboard, and plastic wrap. So these are the five most common waste types that were identified across the CEA supply chain. Uh, next table. So in the next table, we see what is called an emissions factor. So the EPA has um, created what are called emissions factors in order to allow us to basically understand the impact that a certain activity could have in terms of emissions. So as you can see in these tables, uh, in, the, in these rows here, well, um, if I, for example, recycle uh, cardboard, then I'm gonna have an emissions factor of 0.11. Whereas if I landfill, cardboard, then I'm going to have a higher emissions factor, almost nine times higher. It's going to be 0.9, which means that this activity, landfilling versus recycling, results in more emissions. So these are the numbers that are they're, um, annually updated, usually, and they're um, uh, specific usually to a region. So here we're using the ones for the United States. Um, and they are what you use in order to calculate your um, carbon dioxide equivalent. Next slide. So having done that, I was able to now calculate what are our baseline emissions. Um, so everything being as it is today, how we're operating based on the information I got from the CEA farms of these five top waste products, um, what is the current um, uh, baseline? How many emissions are being uh, emitted from my disposal practices. So sometimes, for example, cardboard could be recycled, sometimes it could be landfilled. So this is a combination of activities that are happening that represents what's typically happening today. It's a mix of management practices. So that all being calculated, we see here that the top two emitting waste types out of the five top waste types were cardboard boxes and plastic containers. So both of these had um, over 70 metric tons of CO2E per year for every million heads of lettuce grown. Next slide. So I wanted to be able to now say, well, okay, we understand how things are happening today. Well, how can we make them better? Um, so where is our room for improvement? So I then modeled what would be considered um, the best case versus the worst case of each of these disposal practices. As you see, we dropped off the last two, which were um, PPE and um, plastic wrap, because those two waste products don't really have a better management method necessarily than, you know, most of the time they're landfilled. It's difficult to recycle them using just normal municipal services. They get caught in machinery and things like that. So we took those, uh, so I took those out of this analysis. But for the three remaining waste types, we have cardboard, plastic, and um, organic waste. There are easy ways to, um, to uh, improve our disposal practices. So um, best case was, considered that 100% of this waste stream is now going into uh, diversion, is now being diverted from the landfill. So in the case of cardboard, it's being, uh, and, and plastic, it's being recycled. And in the case of organic waste, it's being composted. And in the worst case, we're saying all of it is going to the landfill. Whereas in our baseline case, it was a mix of the two. So having done this analysis, we see here that cardboard boxes are the one thing 
out of those three that could have the biggest impact. So if we improve the recycled, recycling rate of cardboard boxes, we can really improve our metric ton CO2e emitted per year. So per million heads of lettuce, we can um, uh, avoid about um, 237 metric tons of CO2e from cardboard box. And if you wanna see that same value, but by acre of growing space, well, then that would be 646 metric tons of CO2e. Next slide. Now, a lot of times um, a CA operator, um, well, the problem is that it's not that someone doesn't want to improve the disposal practices to be more ecologically friendly. It's just a matter of, well, those services don't exist in the municipality where they're operating. So this was something that I also um, asked um, growers about. So um, we see that, for example, um, uh, uh, in the recycling category there, well, no one is having recycling out of the interviewed farms that is available for them through municipal services. Um, so it's not just included in their local uh, municipal pickup, they had to either hire a private contractor to come and pick up the recyclables. So nine um, of the 14 did that, or they have to physically go themselves and drop off the recyclable materials. So five out of the 14 had to do that. And when you look at the numbers for composting, it's, it's also similar where um, six had to hire a private contractor, uh, three did self drop off, and three had a way to um, handle the composting on site. But this all shows that improving municipal services could have a big impact also on reducing uh, waste uh, emissions um, just um, by having those services easily available for people so that they don't have to go and do the extra work or pay the extra fee, et cetera. Next slide. So again here, um, we're um, showing the uh, equivalency. So for the top five waste that we talked about on one, uh, produced from one acre of grow space, okay, we're generating 533 metric tons of CO2e per year. Well, well um, a typical one acre greenhouse that's operating in New York State actually generates about the same amount of emissions, 544 from the energy demand. So that helps to kind of put things into perspective. So just those five wastes are equivalent approximately to the energy demand um, in terms of emissions. And this is only the top five wastes and not taking into consideration all the other wastes that aren't in the top five. Next slide. So here are just some other ways to look at it. Um, and um, we'll just skip through this right now to catch up on some time. Same with the next slide. We can skip through this as for sequestration, similar to what we talked about. So here I wanted to point your attention to all of those calculations that I did. Well, I created a, a tool for the CEA growers. Um, sorry, go back one slide. There's a tool for CEA growers in order to um, be able to calculate this for yourself if that's something that interests you. So um, it's an Excel based tool and anyone can have access to it. Um, and it will be placed on a, online somewhere that anyone can download. But for the time being, you can just contact me directly and I can share it with you. Uh, so I'll have my contact at the very end of the presentation. Um, but uh, you just have to input your quantity of each of these wastes and you can even just play around with different numbers and you input those in the blue boxes and then the green boxes will show you basically um, how many emissions your, uh, your facility is um, generating based on each of these waste types and based on the um, method of um, disposal and then you can play around with it and put in different numbers to see well how much can you improve what's uh you know what's the room for improvement there so next slide just overall um industry recommendations in terms of waste management well as we saw cardboard was really one simple way it's the low-hanging fruit here that just by recycling all the cardboard we can reduce emissions quite a bit um, I do want to remind everyone that um, recycling is great, but what's even better is to first reduce when possible. So if you can avoid having this waste product in the first place, well, that's the most sustainable thing you can do. Um, then if you can reuse the item, then that's also great. And then as a last resort, recycle. But recycling is also much better than landfilling. Um, so 
hopefully we can also improve the availability of municipal services since this can definitely be a hurdle for improving waste management. Um, maybe some ways are to, if there are other farms near you, there are ways to pool resources in the meantime and hopefully municipalities will start to provide more and more of these services. So we'll move on to part four now. Um, so now that we've looked a little bit upstream in the supply chain, well, it's also really important to understand what the consumer wants. Um, so here I conducted a willingness to pay study um, speaking to consumers that are based in New York City to understand what are they willing to pay for different CEA lettuces based on price, so different price points look and first um, had conducted some market research by going around to different types of retail outlets, whether they're supermarkets, whether they're um, small bodegas, et cetera, and taking a look at what prices these products are being grown at, um, at uh, sold at, and then um, looking at different growing methods. Is it grown indoor? Is it grown outdoor? Um, is it labeled as organic or pesticide free, or does it not have such a label? Um, and then looking at location grown. So does, does locally grown matter to the consumer? Next slide. So in order to collect the data, I um, collected uh, data at 12 different sites across New York City in order to try as much as possible to get an even representation of the types of consumers that are located in New York City. Um, so I picked two um, sites in each of the five boroughs. So that gave me 10 out of the 12 sites. And then I added two more sites to kind of even it out based on other demographic factors. So the first 10 sites, they were picked based on the highest affluency and the lowest affluency um, areas within each of the five boroughs. Next slide. And then in the other um, two uh, options, uh, the other two sites were selected based on age and based on ethnic diversity. And all of this was also um, in the previous uh, map, um, you could see that um, it was also overlaid with the languages spoken at home um, and some other uh, demographic characteristics to try to get a really even representation of a New York City resident. Next slide. So um, the tested um, attributes and levels. So we looked at production method. Is it field grown or indoor grown? Location, is it grown in New York City, which means it's hyper-local to the New York City residents? Is it grown in New York State or is it just USA grown? Treatment was looked at, um, is it organic or pesticide free on the label? Uh, or is there no such information on the label? And then there were three different price points. So all of this, um, in order to come up with these specific um, attributes, um, I reached out to several CEA growers and uh, tried to get their validation and understand what they thought was um, important. And um, that's how these were selected. Next slide. So I ended up with an eight question survey that I asked folks at those 12 sites. Um, and so in each question, the um, respondent had the option to choose lettuce option A or lettuce option B or C, which was neither A nor B. And in each case, it was a five ounce clamshell of lettuce um, and everything was the same except for the information on the label. So either is it uh, different production method, is it field grown or indoor grown, uh, location grown, treatment and price. So it's a combination of those things. So would you choose A or B if you had these two options or neither A or B? The next slide we see kind of the demographic summary. So um, we did get uh, over 200 respondents in the end um, with usable data. Um, it was um, fairly evenly split in terms of age group. Um, are they um, uh, over 40 or under 40 years of age? Um, had some diversity in terms of ethnicity um, and some uh, diversity in terms of income, um, and, but uh, also diversity in terms of education level. Next slide. So looking at all this and the total responses in the end, um, we can see the overall responses. So this is a lot of info, so I'm just gonna highlight a few in the next slide. Um, so uh, here we see some of the ones I've highlighted in green. So sometimes the decision was easy for folks to make. They were able to easily decide between A or B. Um, so we can see in the first question, um, there was an overwhelming number of people who selected option A. Um, 
et cetera, et cetera. So when we get into the details, we're able to see, okay, this decision was easy. But then there were other times, like in the next slide, where the decision was difficult. So people had a difficult time choosing between A or B. And again, we can kind of go into more detail and see, well, what made that decision difficult? So for example, in option eight, uh, in question eight, we see that, well, 21% of people who responded said they weren't able to decide between A or B. Um, so what, what, what resulted in that decision making? Um, so uh, the next slide we see, well, now I had to find a different way to analyze the results because we have a bunch of different attributes here um, and we're trying to see how they all intertwine. So I used a type of analysis called conditional logit, which allows me to then more um, carefully parse out, um, well, what drove the decision making for the consumer. Um, so we were able to see that overall, people preferred field grown over indoor grown. Well, this could be because of a variety of reasons. Uh, maybe they just don't understand what indoor grown means, for example. So this is an opportunity for the CEA industry to better educate consumers about what indoor grown means. Um, they preferred New York City grown, so local, versus something that came from farther away in the United States. Uh, they preferred the label of either organic or pesticide free versus no such language um, indicating method um, uh, treatment uh, on the package label. And we can even see that there was a slight preference for pesticide free over organic. Um, so that's also interesting. And as we would have expected, they preferred um, things that were priced at 350 uh, more than something that was priced at 450. But um, and and 350 more than 550. But when it came to a comparison of 450 and 550, that wasn't statistically significant. So basically, they either want the cheapest option, or um, once it gets to a higher level, then they're willing to pay more for a certain attributes. So they're no more, no longer driven by price. And this was also broken up based on different demographic features. There's a lot of details here, so we don't really have time to go into all of it. Um, but I'll talk about about some summaries uh, in a later slide. So um, here in the next slide, we see kind of a summary. So um, in addition to some of the things I already called out, well, there were some respondents that preferred, like we said, pesticide-free over organic, and those were typically folks who either didn't have a college degree or were aged more than 40 or happened to identify as Hispanic. Um, so some respondents really definitely made their choice regardless of price. And in that case, um, it was typically folks who either didn't have a college degree or identified as female or were aged over 40 or identified as non-white or identified as Hispanic. So these folks were willing to pay um, more for something if they found it to be a valuable product. Um, and um, here are some pictures that I took when I was going to my different study sites. So here I was on the Staten Island Ferry passing by Lady Liberty on my way to collect data in Staten Island. Uh, next slide. So now we're gonna kind of summarize it. Well, uh, what does it look like to have a more sustainable CEA supply chain? Um, We've talked a lot. We've talked about some of the upstream emissions. We didn't have the opportunity to go into all the different inputs. We really focused just on one substrate, um, given just the amount of time. Uh, we looked at waste disposal practices on site and how that affects emissions. And we looked at consumer preferences. So overall, in the next slide, we see that, to summarize, upstream emissions from stonewall manufacturing, well, particulate matter 10 and particulate matter 2.5 were emitted in concentrations considered above hazardous by the EPA. So these were two pollutants that were above hazardous. CO was emitted in hazardous concentrations. So PM10 and PM2.5 were above hazardous. So it's worse than hazardous. Carbon monoxide was hazardous level. Uh, NO2 is in an unhealthy concentration and SO2 is uh, emitted in concentrations considered um, unhealthy for sensitive groups. Um, waste generation, so we talked about the five most common waste types. We have plastic containers, organic waste, PPE, cardboard, and plastic wrap. So these were the waste types that were most frequently reported as being um, generated on site. 
And um, we saw that of those five uh, waste types, well, recycling cardboard would have the biggest impact. So that's our low hanging fruit. So if there's one thing you can do to reduce your emissions, it would be to make sure that all your cardboard gets recycled. Uh, and then um, from a consumer preference perspective, we saw that consumers prefer field grown lettuce. They prefer locally grown lettuce and they prefer lettuce that was labeled um, either as pesticide free or organic. Next slide. So that was a lot of information. Uh, I'd love to hear um, any of your feedback or questions. And I would also love for you to stay in touch. Here's my email address. Feel free to reach out for any reason, including if you want a copy of the grower tool um, that we talked about. And um, hopefully that will be posted online soon. Um, most likely uh, Glaze will be one of the places um, that it will be posted on the website, um, as well as the Cornell University CEA website. Um, so as soon as that's live also, um, you'll be able to download it from there. All right, thank you. Thanks so much, Maya. That was a really great presentation. And I hope folks who have any more questions to pop them in the Q&A. We're starting the Q&A now with a great question that's that's been on my mind since you were presenting your data. How did you incentivize farms to participate in this self-reporting? How was the data collected? And was any verification by your team or a third party involved? Thank you. Well, that's a great question. Um, so. I um, reached out to many different farms and a lot of folks, they were willing to give information. And if they, were, if they weren't willing, then they just didn't, um, then they just didn't participate. Um, so in my case, because I was trying to keep the scope quite narrow, I really focused on farms based in the United States and I really focused on farms growing lettuce specifically. So there are a lot of other farms that are growing a lot of other types of um, crops. And um, for the waste um, portion, um, that was not uh, considered. Um, so that was just to kind of keep the boundary a little bit tighter on the data that's being collected and make sure it's as consistent as possible. Um, the data was collected verbally. So I spoke with the um, um, operators or representatives from each farm. Um, and uh, got that information. They provided me with the information that they could. Sometimes I had to convert values in order to have basically um, consistent numbers across uh, different uh, reporting from different farms um, and in order to do the calculations um, that we talked about using the EPA emissions factors. Uh, so for example, those calculations are done um, using short ton. So then they would have to convert everything to short ton, um, et cetera, et cetera. So that was all done using um, EPA accepted values for conversion. Um, all of that is detailed a lot more in my dissertation. Uh, we don't have time, unfortunately, to get into all of the numbers and conversions, but it's all there in detail. Um, and there was not any verification. So this was all done on the honor system. Um, so hoping, hoping that the information that was provided was accurate. Thanks for that answer. Um, so in, in summary, you didn't have to incentivize any of the farms that chose to participate. They chose to, to volunteer the information without any sort of inducement. Exactly. Um, so I did not incentivize them. I did incentivize the consumers, but I did not incentivize the producers. Great, thanks. Um, uh, going to the cardboard, did you see any, is there any story of a particular farm doing anything surprising with used cardboard to to reuse it or um, prevent it from entering the waste stream? Yeah, that's a really good question. Yeah, there were different folks that were coming up with different innovations, um, not just for cardboard, but for other types of waste as well. Um, so for cardboard specifically, I had some um, report that, well, they just, instead of buying boxes to ship their products, they would just reuse the same boxes that came in with their shipments. So that's a, you know, a, a really nice and simple way to, um, to reuse a product instead of sending it to the waste stream. Um, some others, uh, if they had, so again, the farms really differed in terms of their location, were they urban, were they rural, in terms of their uh, square footage, things like that. But some folks had a lot of extra land around. And so they would use the cardboard for different um, purposes, such as laying them um, 
uh, to fill in uh, certain areas or to cover um, you know, weeds or things like that. So there were some creative ways to use cardboard um, as well as some of the other waste streams. So for example, for organic waste, some of them, um, rather than sending it to composting, well, they operated in a rural area where there would be like livestock farms nearby. So they would offer their organic waste as feed for livestock and that would help um, to divert it from the waste stream. Did you see anyone doing like waste to energy um, with their bio waste? I had one farm that was looking at some um, opportunities to do something on site, but they were still in the uh, research phase. Um, I think that that is common in, in certain parts of the world, but it's a little bit less common in the United States and um, yeah. also does take a certain amount of land mass. So also it depends on the how much square footage they had. Some of them operated in really small areas while some operated in much larger areas. Some had on-site composting as well. Again, it depends on how much space they had. Yeah, it'd be interesting to see the opportunity for microgrids where maybe it's not just one facility having to make their own waste to energy stream, but multiple facilities contributing. Yes. Um, I think we have time for one more question. Um, have you done any contributions regarding research to the, for the cannabis industry? And do you have any plans on researching uh, cannabis uh, impact? Yeah, so um, I had the opportunity to speak with a cannabis grower, but I didn't really target cannabis growers because this was really supposed to be focused on vegetable growing. Um, so, but the same types of principles can be um, applied. Um, so um, in terms of, for example, substrate selection, in terms of reuse of, of products, in terms of diversion from the landfill, um, things like that. So there are a lot of opportunities there. Um, but uh, this research was really focused on vegetables and specifically lettuce, um, but um, it can be applied to tomatoes, it can be applied to peppers, you know, it can be applied to, to so many different crops. Great. Well, thank you very much for answering these questions, and I hope the attendees learned a lot today. Um, thanks, Haley. Yeah, thank you so much, thank everyone, you. for joining, and the recording of this will go out in the next day or two. Have Wonderful. a great day. Thank you so much. Thank, Thank you. you, Maya. Take care. Bye-bye.